Hi, super scientists. We're going to be looking at water filtration and water quality indicators. And we've talked a little bit about those already on one of your charts with water quality indicators. So water quality is going to be looking at the measurement of substances in the water besides water molecules. So that's going to be specifically looking at the concentration, the amount of a substance that is in the water that's not supposed to be in the water. So you have some different substances listed here that are commonly tested for to indicate how healthy or unhealthy a water sample might be. And this is the concentration limit, so the amount that is acceptable for water uh, to be in water. So copper, that's um, a metal, lead is a metal, coliform, that's referring to E. coli bacteria, like we talked about the E. coli outbreak at the Cleveland County Fair. So this coliform, basically, that gets in water from contaminated poo. Arsenic um, is poisonous, carbon tetrachloride, also poisonous, and can cause some nervous system problems as well. So your next thing here is a picture. So take a look at this picture for just a minute. So you see here that there's a, a body of water, whether it's a lake or a pond, and you have a whole bunch of different white stuff on it. So all those white things are dead fish. So this is an example of a fish kill. So the next thing that is on your lab sheet is looking at what a fish kill is. So a fish kill is basically we have a bunch of fish that have died in the same body of water. And we're going to talk about fish kills and what caused them in just a few minutes. So fish kill is a bunch of fish that have died in the same area, in the same lake or pond. And you can put in parentheses dissolved oxygen because dissolved oxygen um, is one of the things that um, will cause you to have a fish kill, a lack of oxygen in the water for the fish to be able to breathe. So there's several different water quality indicators. And this is showing you some different pH strips. And of course you have a nice, beautiful rainbow pH scale over here. You may not have seen these orange strips before, but you may be familiar with testing the pH of water. If you ever have tested pool water or water in a fish tank, a lot of times you'll take a little sample of water and you put small drops in it, and then you spin a wheel or you look at a card that's sort of like the pH scale here. It's not gonna have all these nice little pictures on the side, but it's gonna be rainbow colored like this. And you compare that to the color that the water sample changes with the indicator solution and that tells you about the pH and if it's really low number it's very acidic or if it's a high number it's going to be very alkaline and we know that water should be neutral should be seven and based on the water quality chart that you guys did the other day you know that the range aquatic organisms can tolerate it's going to be right around um, the six and a half to eight range so much lower than that or much higher than that is going to be problematic for organisms Water hardness is another thing that people will check with water samples, and that's not talking about like water being hard physically, because water's not solid, but it's talking about having these two minerals in it, and these are also alkaline earth metals. Throw back to the periodic table. Calcium, Ca, magnesium, Mg. So some water samples are going to have calcium and magnesium in it, and that's because of the minerals that are in the ground. Um, in certain aquifers or certain rock layers getting absorbed into that groundwater. So when that groundwater is used for drinking water, it may have an accumulation of those minerals. So if you look at the map here, this is North Carolina. So we have, based on the topography of North Carolina, a couple different zones of water hardness. So where we are in the Piedmont, it's red, and that's moderately hard. The coastal plain area down at the beach is yellow, so that's slightly hard. That's the lowest on the scale. And then we have this blue area, so that is in the middle of this scale that we have. So the blue area for the mountains is hard water. And one way you may have noticed that if you've ever traveled to the beach or to the mountains, that drinking water sometimes will taste a little bit different. And then also I've noticed it when you go to certain areas like in the mountains, since they have hard water, sometimes as you're trying to wash your hands, we you put soap on your hands and you scrub them together and try to get the bubbles to kind of foam up, sometimes that doesn't happen and it's really slippery and slimy and you don't get a lot of bubbles. Bubbles, uh, or suds and that's because of water hardness and one other thing that I've seen a lot is this so on faucets on outdoor um, spigots and things like that sometimes you'll see this kind of green white mineral corrosion on the metal fixtures and that's due to the water hardness as well if you look at this picture you have a big river that's being converged right here You've got all of this sort of brown water and all this nice, blue, pretty clean looking water. 
So I want you to think about what might cause it to be two different colors, knowing it's both water, and it's converging right here, but you can very clearly see a distinct line. So that picture is related to turbidity. Turbidity is just the clearness of water, how clear the water is or not clear. So the turbidity is going to be um, greater. It's going to be um, more, an increase in turbidity, if you have more solids, more junk, more dirt, more plankton, or waste like poo that's dissolved in the water. And it's going to be lower turbidity if it's more clear. So if you look back at this picture, this on the left is going to be higher turbidity because it's really muddy looking and dirty. And then this is going to be lower turbidity because it's pretty clear and clean looking. So there's several different things that can contribute to turbidity. One is dirt, of course, like we saw the picture on the left on the previous slide. So if you've got a lot of sediment or soil that's dissolved in the water from erosion, if you have a heavy rain, for example, that's going to cause you to have really high turbidity. But also plankton. So another term for plankton is algae. So if you have a lot of algae dissolved in water, what color might it be? Yeah, it might be green. So if you have a lot of plant, plant life or aquatic plants, algae that's dissolved in water, it might, instead of being this brown color, you might have um, green colored water due to that high turbidity. And a lot of the rivers and lakes like Moss Lake around here are going to be kind of brown. And that's because we have a lot of sediment that gets eroded into the water. And we also have a lot of iron in the soil. So sometimes that dirt, you know, has a little bit of a reddish tint due to that iron oxide. This is one way that some places will try and manage turbidity so that they can monitor the amount of turbidity in an area. So this is called a turbidity curtain, and it's basically just like a dam that's been built to prevent all this sediment and this turbid water from mixing in with this clean water that maybe uh, this could be a reservoir. So this could be used as drinking water at um, like a particular city. And it's got this little opening here so that it doesn't have too much of an increase in pressure along this dam and basically break it or knock it down. So that turbidity curtain helps to control the um, turbidity in the clean water section. Number four is bioindicator. So what's your STEM bio mean? It means life. So bioindicators are living organisms that indicate how good or bad a water sample is. So we have um, bad water sample over here, lots of E. coli bacteria. We talked about E. coli, you know, giving you diarrhea and being really bad digestively. So if you have E. coli that's in a water sample, then that tells you that's not too good. Don't drink that. But you wouldn't know, right, if you were just looking at it because you got to look at it under a microscope to be able to see if it's got E. coli. But around here, we have a lot of these guys, a lot of salamanders. And salamanders are amphibians. They have um, this thin skin that will allow them to soak in moisture and chemicals that could potentially be in water. They are pollution intolerant, which means that they can't live in areas where there's a lot of pollution. They will die. They will go elsewhere because they absorb, since they're amphibious, they absorb that water and that moisture into their skin. And I just thought this was a cool picture I wanted to show you guys because this is like the largest salamander species. And I can't remember the specific name of the species, but it's in South America. And I just thought it was neat because it's huge. And number five is dissolved oxygen. So we breathe in oxygen, right? And other animals do too, even aquatic animals. So if you think about a fish, fish has gill gills and those gills will allow water to come in and they filter out the oxygen that goes to their lungs so that they can breathe so that it will allow for their respiratory system to function and so they can go through um you know cellular respiration for their mitochondria give them some energy so the oxygen is going to get in the water in a couple different ways one the oxygen can get in the water from the air so basically where the air comes in contact with the water some of the oxygen is going to dissolve into the water and then photosynthesis so if you've got plants like here you've got some algae aquatic plants and algae are going to be releasing some of the oxygen into the water and dissolved oxygen levels, if it gets too low, below 5 milligrams per liter, that's going to cause too much stress on an aquatic organism and will lead to a fish kill. So this is our picture we were looking at earlier. And there can be other things that cause fish kills, but the primary thing is going to be a lack of oxygen because that will cause those organisms to suffocate. So dissolved oxygen um, levels being too low can cause fish kills and can also be um, attributed to or caused by 
algae blooms, which we had an article about last week on the back of your most missed questions that you should have read, eutrophication, which remember we talked about the progression of eutrophication, how you start out with a lake, and then it has a little bit of algae in it, and then it's got a lot more algae in it, and it's starting to kind of fill in, and then the death of a lake where you don't have that lake anymore, but it's got a lot of grass and plants in it, and can also be caused by the turbidity being too high. So those are just a couple of different things that can lead to dissolve oxygen levels being too low. This is um, a diagram I wanted to show you. It's not in your notes. It's just looking at wastewater. So this is how you treat wastewater as in waste like poo water. So um, we flush the toilet, the water goes somewhere. So it goes into a pipe. And depending on if you have a septic tank or um, sewage system, maybe a little bit different. So the pipe enters here and then you've got um, this solid brown colored stuff that is really dense and soaks down to the bottom. Um, so that becomes what's referred to as sludge and that gets pumped out of septic tanks. And then you have all this stuff at the top that's less dense and watery and looks kind of um, scuzzy and scummy. So that's a word, scum. And so that um, less dense material is going to be floating at the top. And then this is just an outlet pipe that will allow for that um, liquid to be pumped elsewhere. And the last thing is treating drinking water. So chlorination is the first um, term on here. And we're going to look at a diagram of the drinking water treatment process in just a minute. So think about why chlorine might be added to pool water to kill germs and stuff that might be in the water, right? That could make people sick. Same thing with chlorine. And sometimes you um, notice that with drinking water or um, when you're taking a bath or um, taking a shower, sometimes there's a slight smell of chlorine and that's because chlorine is added to your drinking water also for the same purpose, to kill disease causing microorganisms. Filtration is another step and usually when you're treating drinking water you have a couple of different steps of filtration to catch different size particles. So this is a filter right here. You've got water with a bunch of different solids suspended in it that is moving through. And then what comes out is um, the materials that are too small to be captured in the filter, depending on the size of the screen. And then coagulation is the last step on here. And coagulation, your stem co means together. So coagulation is where you have a powder that's called alum added to a water sample. And it creates these sticky globs that are called flocks. It's a weird word, it's flocks. Not like a flock of birds, but it's a muddy, sticky flock. And bacteria, mud, sediment, small particles will stick to these flocks, and then the flocks can be filtered out of the water sample. So this is showing you the progression of uh, coagulation. So you have a muddy, nasty looking water sample here. You've got alum that's added to the water and all this globby, sticky nastiness at the bottom is the flock that can then be separated from the water sample. And then you have a pretty clear water sample afterwards. So the last thing is your diagram at the bottom where you can see the water filtration process. So you can see each of the different steps. We're just gonna write down the name of the step on your diagram and you can take a look at what happens at each of these steps. So the water is entering here and it's passing through these screens. This is your first filtration. So big stuff is gonna be captured here, leaves, twigs, whatever. And then the water continues moving down through here and goes into the coagulation tank where you have alum that's added and you can see the sticky flux at the bottom. So the water is just kind of moving along through there and that allows more surface area so that um, you'll have more flux that are generated and more particles that are captured. And then it continues into the settling basin. So anything else um, that is going to be um, taken out of the drinking water and those other larger particles will settle down to the bottom here. Uh, so water um, is added to the mixture that you had kind of accumulating in the coagulation step. So then the water continues on and you have a second filtration. So during this step you're going to have smaller things that get filtered out. So we have large particles at the first filtration you're going to have um, a smaller uh, mesh size of the um, filter. So sand and gravel, some algae and bacteria, some other things can be, be trapped in the second filtration. Then chlorine is added. So you have chlorine added to kill any microorganisms that might cause disease. Aeration occurs right here. So basically aeration is just putting air into the water and that's why you might have like air bubbles in water that you might get from your faucet sometimes or in a glass of water. So that helps to just um, sort of minimize any odor or taste that you might have in the water sample from this whole process. 
and then it continues on wherever it needs to go and eventually will end up at your house. So you should have everything completed on that page for 3.2 water filtration.